Nothing like a feel-good passage of scripture on a Sunday morning, huh? We are in the midst of a sermon series, the B-I-B-L-E, and today we will explore our second problematic text, a difficult passage of scripture that perhaps we would just rather avoid. Next week we wrap up our series with our third problematic passage, and let me tell you, if you think these two are bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. That one is probably the most difficult yet. For today, though, we'll focus some time on the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, and we'll wonder together whether or not God really does curse those who disobey. Let's begin with prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on all of us. Open our ears, open our hearts, and open our minds to the revelation of your good news today and every day. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is said to contain the first of three farewell sermons that Moses gave to the people of Israel just before he died as the people were perched to enter the promised land, the home that they'd searched 40 years to find. This sermon of Moses begins with some oddly specific curses. Cursed be anyone who moves a neighbor's boundary marker. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind person on the road. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And as we discovered last week, that would have meant that Abraham would have been cursed. And the list goes on and on. This sets up a specific list of blessings that immediately follow these lists of curses that are made available to those who follow the laws of God. Just following the blessings is, or just following these blessings is an additional list of curses. So we've got a curse sandwich with blessings in the middle. And Sandy just read the latter ones, the ones that seem horrific in nature. And everywhere I turned in my research on today's text, I found theologians and pastors taking this text fairly literally and applying the thinking behind blessings and cursings to our 21st century context. Over and over again, I read something along the lines of, do good and God's blessings will be poured out upon you, but do wrong and sin against God and bad things will happen to you. Each time I read these same thoughts, my heart broke just a little. Because I know some very good people. People who consistently show God's love and to whom very bad things have happened. Things that probably feel a whole lot like a curse. And to the contrary, I know some people who live as if they are the only person in the world that matters. And their lives seem to be filled with good things, things that appear to be blessings. Does that ring true for you in your own experiences too? I think for most of us it does. So then what are we to make of this difficult text that doesn't add up in real time? As much as I hate to admit it, It does seem reasonable to chalk some of this up to natural consequences. Maybe those pastors and theologians who I don't want to agree with are on to something. Perhaps in this way we could compare the commandments of God to the laws of gravity. See, if you disobey a law of gravity by, say, uh, walking off the roof of your house, your subsequent fall to the ground and breaking of a leg is not gravity cursing you or taking vengeance on you for breaking its rules. It's simply the fully expectable effect of a cause. That's the way gravity works. Similarly, refusing to practice justice and peace as commanded in God's laws creates a condition where the quality of life in which you live will be diminished. There may be short-term apparent gains, for sure. But in the longer view, injustice and strife always turn out to be unsustainable ways of living. And that's 
not because God vengefully punishes those who are outside God's chosen law-abiding group, but simply because that's the way the universe works. So yes, I think there is some value in thinking about the text this way, recognizing natural consequences of our actions and our behaviors in this world. Nonetheless, I still find the blessing and curse bilateral view troubling. It's either this way or that way. And nothing good ever comes of a this way or that way kind of thinking, does it? So maybe let's explore the context of Deuteronomy just a little bit. When the Israelites were poised to enter the promised land, the world was made up of tribes that each governed themselves based upon their own religious practices in relationship to their tribal god. These tribes largely isolated each other, one from another, and based their communal practices on the codes and the laws of their tribe alone. And in these tribal contexts, the tribe's gods were the very source of everything that happened in the life of the community, good and bad. And what we see in Deuteronomy is the Israelites organizing their understanding of God based upon the culture and context of the time in a blessing and curse framework. That second half of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, when a people who worship God out of fear shows us what that looks like. It reads like a horror story. We stopped the reading halfway through it because we couldn't stomach the whole thing. But it goes on and on and on for 30 verses of curses. Saying things like, your corpses shall be food for every bird of the air and animal of the earth. And there shall be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt with tumors, scurvy, and itch of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. 30 verses of hatred and vitriol. All the things that God will do to God's beloved if they don't keep every one of God's commandments. For me, friends, this punishing God goes far beyond that concept of natural consequences, even beyond the conventions of a tribal God. This God appears cruel and vindictive and small and petty and needy. Honestly, That isn't a God I want to be in relationship with. So that leads me to wonder, what if the biblical text is simply wrong and no amount of mental gymnastics can redeem it for our context? Hear me out now. It was made by human Minds with limited human capacity who gathered their thoughts in a tribal context. But that is not our context, and it does not have to be our understanding of God. The Bible is just one tool that we can use to see God, to know God. There are other paths to knowing God that are as holy or holier than the Bible. Last Sunday, Ron and Susan Zorn told me about a United Church of Christ congregation who deliberately tore out the back covers of every Bible they had in their building because they wanted their UCC motto, God is still speaking, to mean something. And so they refused to put a period on the sacred text as if the gospel isn't continually being written right now in our time. 
And it's not just something that's written. It's something that is experienced and lived. You and I and the very lives that we lead when we lead them in the path of Jesus are writing the sacred text as we breathe in God's creation. One of my favorite Christian writers, John Pavlovitz, who in my mind is writing sacred text, he posited that going to the beach is like meeting God. He says the thing about the ocean is that until you experience it, no one can explain it to you. And once you have experienced it, no one needs to. Beloved, I think he is right. God is like the ocean. So vast, so expansive that we could never fully comprehend God. Even if we take Pavlovitz's metaphor literally and imagine standing on a windy beach with toes in the sand, watching the waves of the ocean roll in with awe, if we are paying attention, we will encounter God there. Or have you ever placed your finger gently into the palm of a newborn baby's hand? and watched as instinctively they curl their tiny little infant fingers around it. Surely, in that infant's face, we see the face of God. We're on bended knee, pouring out the hurts, the anguish that we feel at the loss of a loved one. On our knees in moments of pain and heartache, God comes to us so that God might bear our burdens. Should we dismiss these encounters with the Holy One because we've read something else about God's nature in Deuteronomy? Oh, on the contrary. We limit our understanding of God when we limit the places and ways in which we can know and experience God. If we are counting solely on the words on one page to tell us who God is, then we will miss God entirely. The Bible does not contain God. The Bible cannot contain God. Sometimes what we even know of God in our souls or what is being revealed of God in the sacred texts that are still being written today provide us an image of God that contradicts the biblical text. And that is okay. Because our faith should be placed not in any one text, but in the God who has been revealed to us through the person of Jesus. Many... Many times, Jesus' teachings contradicted the sacred text because he always erred on the side of love. And if Jesus is the fullest revelation of the character of God, then we can reasonably say that God is not cruel, that God is not vindictive, God is not small or petty or needy. God cannot and will not curse humanity. This problematic passage in the Bible, it doesn't need to be problematic if we see it for what it is. Human beings trying their best to make sense of their experiences in the light of their tribal context and getting it wrong. And because they got it wrong does not mean that we have to get it wrong. We can step out into a new way of knowing and experiencing God because we are not bound to their experiences. We are free to experience God for ourselves without worrying about being cursed by God. So go and stand at the ocean. Hold the hand of a baby. Fall on your knees and pray, or whatever it is for you, put on a beautiful piece of music that stirs your soul so deep you know that the Holy One is there with you. 
You'll find God in all those places. And you'll see that it is God who loves you too much to ever curse you. Thanks be to God for that love. Amen.